Greetings, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. On behalf of the Feed the Future and USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, I welcome you to our webinar, ICT for Ag, Unpack Unpacking Sustainability Journeys. I'm your host and friendly neighborhood uh, knowledge management advisor, Zachary Baquet, with the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Before we dive into the content, let us take a moment to go over a few items to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourself, ask questions, and share resources with your colleagues. The chat box allows you to connect and network with colleagues from around the globe. We will collect your questions from the chat box throughout the webinar. We will have our Q&A after the presenters have spoken. In case you find the presentation screen too small, you can increase the size of the presentation on your screen by clicking on the four arrows in the upper right of your screen. This will make the presentation larger. You can click on the arrows again to shrink it back to normal. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll email you the recording, transcript, and additional resources once we have them ready. We will also post these resources on agrilinks.org, so you can find them there on the event page as well. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for your participation. Now onwards to our presentations and discussions for today's webinar, ICT for Ag, Unpacking Sustainability Journeys. With that, I am pleased to introduce Josh Woodard. Josh serves as Senior Digital Advisor with USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. He has extensive experience in digital agriculture and resilience, particularly in Asia and Africa. Prior to joining USAID, he ran a technology for development consulting firm, during which he led the development of the digital agricultural strategies for several international donors and organizations. Before that, he worked at FHI 360 for over a decade. During that time, he oversaw USAID-funded efforts in Bangladesh, India, and Myanmar to help expand uptake of digital financial services in agricultural cell value chains. From 2009 to 2013, he led USAID's FACET project, which focused on promoting the uptake of ICT in agricultural projects from across uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And with that, I hand it over to Josh. Great, thank you so much, Zachary. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and back on a um, an AgriLinks webinar. It's been uh, back when I was with Facet a decade or so ago. Um, we did some AgriLinks webinars uh, in the early days, so it's great to see how things uh, have evolved. And we have a great audience here, which I'm excited about. Um, so. Just a bit of background uh, into the work before we get started, um, into the start of the session. So this really, the idea for this webinar came out of a session that um, was held at IC for Ag 2020 um, on around digital inclusion and private sector engagement. And the question that came up was, you know, we see there's a lot of donor investment in the digital agriculture space. Um, you know, one report, the Digitalization of African Agriculture Report, found that in Africa, uh, donor funding for digital ag was more than threefold um, what the private investment um, in digital ag was in 2018. Um, but we've also seen a lot of, uh, you know, let's say failed or you know, non-sustainable um, digital ag interventions that are donor supported. Uh, but the question came up, you know, how do how do digital agriculture platforms or services uh, that are primarily uh, more largely donor supported evolve into lasting business models? Um, so, you know, we have today, I think, three different perspectives that, um, that Jean Michel Parasto and Casey will share um, in terms of what they've seen from their work, in terms of the role of development organizations in supporting or enabling um, that transition to successful or viable business models in the digital agriculture space. So with that your background out of the way, um, let me give you a, a little bit of an introduction into our three speakers that we have today. 
So first we have uh, Prasto Hamed, um, who's a field coordinator with AgResults. Um, you see her bio here, but in short, you know, Prasto has 12 years of experience in international development, program design and implementation, specializing in agricultural development, um, including five years with Deloitte as project manager, as a project management specialist master. Um, she currently serves as a field coordinator for AgResults, which is a multi-donor initiative that designs and implements implements innovative pay-for-results prize competitions that engage the private sector to overcome agricultural challenges and improve livelihoods in developing countries. Before Deloitte, uh, she was working as a project manager at CNFA and Commonics, uh, where she managed USAID projects in East and Southern Africa, as well as the Middle East. Rosto has a Master's of Professional Studies in International Agriculture and Rural Development from Cornell University and a Master of Science in International Development from the London School of Economics and Political Science. After Parasto, we will have, we'll hear from Jean-Michel Wassad, who's the Director of Market Systems at RTI International. Uh, Jean-Michel has over 20 years of experience. Uh, during that time, he's worked throughout West Africa, linking the private sector and banks of grassroots rural organizations to build sustainable market systems that benefit small farmers. Early in his career as a financial systems specialist in the food distribution sector, he was a partner of the North American uh, transition to the integrated, the integrated supply chain platforms and personal computer networks. Uh, moving on to development work, he's since 2005, uh, he's promoted the mainstreaming of a array of digital technologies such as GIS, remote data transmission, cloud computing, supply chain management, and smallholder managed data analytics to support inclusive agriculture value chains. His work with Senegalese farm organizations is documented by Feed the Future Best Practice Note, Finding the Best Fit, um, the column by, and other publications. And actually uh, came to know Jean-Michel through his work in Senegal almost close to a decade ago. Um, we did some work together when I was working with Bassett. Um, along with Judy Payne, who I see uh, is also with us uh, in the chat. And then finally, after Jean-Michel, we'll hear from Casey Harrison, who is the Livelihoods and Agribusiness Director at Nuru International. Casey joined Nuru International in 2016 and guides agribusiness and livelihoods impact programming across a network of Nuru local organizations in Kenya, Ethiopia, and Nigeria, with a focus on scaling in the Sahel region of West Africa. As a member of the Agribusiness Market Ecosystem Alliance, or MIA, he leads the Agricultural Technology Working Group that aims to accelerate the development of rural SMEs and farm organizations globally. Casey received a dual MA in Natural Resource Management and International Development from American University in Washington, D.C., and the University for Peace in Costa Rica. Prior to Nuru, he served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Zambia as an Agricultural Extension Agent and worked at the World Wildlife Fund for four years developing inclusive value chain approaches to conservation and development challenges. Um, so with that, let me uh, pass the mic to Parasto for her presentation. Um, we'll have all three speakers will present first, uh, and then after that we will jump into a hopefully very lively and robust uh, Q&A. Feel free to put questions in the chat as we go, so don't hold uh, until the end. Parasto, over to you. Thank you, Josh. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, as Josh mentioned, today I'll be looking at Ag Results Paper Results Initiative and how leveraging the prize model uh, is a journey to create sustainability. So Ag Results is a $152 million multi-donor initiative that uses the Paper Results Prize competition to incentivize private sector to invest in high-impact agricultural innovation that helps reduce food insecurity, improve household health and nutrition, and increase livestock productivity. The Ag Results theory of change rests on the idea that if appropriately incentivized, the private sector will respond by creating and or scaling new technologies that benefit smallholder farmers. Ag Results has had a total of 10 projects six of which are currently being implemented, and four that have been completed or closed. Our results looks at engaging private sector uh, entities uh, with the following ways. We look at 
sectors that demonstrate economic potential of expanding into untapped offerings and are investing in underserved markets. We also look at leveraging a prize incentive while remaining solution agnostic to encourage the private sector risk-taking and investment. And then third, we look to strengthen supply chains or value chains and markets by encouraging new and inclusive relationships between smallholder farmers and private sectors. Overall, with the projects that we in implement, we look at how these projects can be taken to scale, but also how can they be sustainable and continue after the initiative ends. The specific project that I'll be looking at today is the Tanzania Dairy Productivity Challenge Project, which encourages input suppliers to deliver input bundles to smallholder farmers to boost productivity and strengthen the value chain. In Tanzania, the dairy sector struggles with approximately 95% of the cattle in low-yielding breeds. There's a prevalence of poor forage management, feed supply fluctuation, farmers with limited access to inputs and extension services. To address this project, a problem, the project aims to increase dairy productivity and smallholder farmer income, as well as strengthen the value chain relationships between small older farmers, and the former dairy sector. To achieve this, we've designed an incentive for each competing input supplier to receive a prize for delivering different productivity increasing input bundles to a minimum of 200 smallholder dairy farmers, as well as requiring them to provide extension services. As part of the initiative, we've we are using a digital platform to track input sales and delivery. The data collection and tracking system uh, allows private sector input providers to collect farmer information and track sales productivity uh, enhancing inputs. This data collection and tracking system gathers critical data that helps agriculture determine which competitors qualify for a prize. The four capabilities of the system are first farmer profiling, which allows competitors to track farmer information such as name, gender, contact information, number of cows, and the farmer's location. Second allows competitors to log transactions as they are required to register all transactions and advisory services with farmers. The system tracks and attributes each transaction to a registered smallholder farmer recording each input sold by type and quantity. Farmers also are able to receive SMS notifications for each transaction or advisory service that takes place. This SMS allows farmers to respond to whether or not they receive the input or advisory service and confirm or deny the receipt. Finally, the data collection and tracking system tracks competitor sales data and allows the project to run reports in real time. This enables the competition sales verifier to monitor sales of inputs and advisory services and identify any abnormalities. The data collection and tracking system goes beyond verifying competition results. It is also positioning the Tanzania private sector to build an inclusive relationship with the farmers that will continue even after the project ends. And it will do so in two different ways. First, through strong input supplier farmer linkages. The competitors will be able to use this data that they collect in the data collection and tracking system by sending automated SMSs about new inputs and extension services to more farmers, specifically those that are in remote areas allowing the competitors to increase their input sales. Farmers will have more access to information through their phones that will help them improve uh, aspects of their farming, such as general animal husbandry, feed and waste management, other health and hygiene, vaccination scheduling, and the proper use and storage of inputs. This system will also create better access to information. Competitors through the system will be able to track their inventory and their sales and draw from that information how they can better improve their business model. Farmers 
will have better access to information such as milk prices and other market data, providing them with an entry point to a formalized market, especially among those who are previously marginalized. The Ag Results example shows that we can provide one type of journey that development actors can use an example through the pay for results model. Ag Results pay for results price competition uses monetary awards to show private sector the potential economic benefits to reach new consumers. By incorporating ICT into the contest, it shapes how competitors are able to gather and use their data of previously inaccessible groups or previous groups that they weren't working with, such as smallholder farmers. Gathering more information about consumers through ICT drives change in the com competitor's behavior and business model. More efficient and more mutually beneficial interactions between the private sector and farmer translates to a stronger value chain relationship. And through a stronger value chain, the sector is better poised for sustainability from a market and from a profitability business model standpoint. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tarasco. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, okay, I will be presenting to you the lessons learned from uh, Senegal, and... Uh, Jean-Michel, you're very faint, your audio. Okay. Is that a... Hello. Not really. <laughs> well, you can turn up... Okay, hold on, everyone. Uh, Jean-Michel, you can uh, turn up your audio by clicking the audio... Um, the um, audio tab up at the top, um, where the microphone is, and do adjust microphone volume. It's the drop down right next to the microphone. And if you just do adjust volume, you can increase the volume of your microphone. muted, but once you do increase the level of your microphone, please unmute. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's great, Jean-Michel. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so uh, this this presentation uh, concerns uh, uh, Feed the Future program in Senegal and, and the farmer organizations that were involved with it, uh, where uh, we put data really at the uh, center of the program and uh, had an approach that focused on making sure that the farmers used to this data. So you have on the starting picture uh, a, a young woman who's actually uh, what we call the database manager of a rice cooperative in the center of Senegal, and uh, she is part of the organization and manages on a, a laptop uh, the various activities uh, of an organization that numbers farmers in a very simple context. Um, so that was really, you know, the something that was really uh, driving actually the success of the Natal by project. It's, it's data driven and farmer managed uh, digital technology environment. Uh, that environment allowed, you know, was based on basic Excel spreadsheet databases, which allowed farmers to perform uh, analytics on the production. Uh, they were able to develop uh, electronic data interchange with clients based on uh, basic spreadsheets, which allowed uh, mass registration insurance programs, uh, loan applications, several hundreds, if not thousands of farmers, and uh, managing uh, supplier procurement. Uh, they were also able to uh, do GPS-enabled field mapping, online digital data collection, uh, and also have same-day rainfall and weather data collection and reporting, and also uh, have 
be part of real-time grain commodity stock monitoring uh, that is linked to bank, uh, tracking systems to facilitate working capital. Uh, all of that actually not managed by a third party or by a firm or by a bank, but by themselves as uh, you know full agents of the system. Now, the project itself is over. I mean, it's been two seasons now after closeout, and those data systems, a lot of them have actually survived and evolved, okay, which is actually a, a sign of, of health in terms of system development. And we did, uh, RTI funded a, a study with four of those larger networks, and we found that those simple data systems were uh, actually key in helping them manage and self-manage their COVID-19 response efforts and stay in the game and be able to and uh, limit and the four uh, reports that are there are in the uh, download uh, box. I encourage you to download them. They're 12-page little briefers. One of them was actually prepared by the U.S. Global Development Lab, and it'll give you the details of how data was used in Natal by in this very special way where farmers are actually the ones managing the whole thing. Uh, now, how did that happen? Uh, actually, this decision to go in that direction came from uh, an unsuccessful uh, off-taker slash smallholder uh, relationship uh, where the contract did not, you know, end well. And the farmer organization asked us to self-man, if, if we were amenable, rather than support the off-taker, why not support the organization to develop those same things that the off-taker was doing? And to be coherent, we said, well, okay, but then that means we have to have those farmers develop the same skills as the off-taker. And at the time, well, the off-taker was mainly working with Excel spreadsheets and basic, you know, utilities that made the whole system work. So we decided to create an architecture around that, around these no-cost or low-cost off-the-shelf software that are readily available. Another principle, uh, you know, to the development of this system, uh, where the farmer organizations really pick up those skills, was to get youth on board and, and understand that for a community to adopt digital technology, you don't need to have everyone be a pro on Excel, okay? Uh, there's a difference between digital literacy and having digital skills available. At and we have this preset now that, you know, I can really vouch for is that there is a geek in every village. Okay? You just have to find the geek. And very often, it's a, it's a young woman, actually. And, and these young people who may have had, like, the tenth grade are able to manage the package, which was like three basic spreadsheets, no frills, but the trainings focus on them building accuracy, timeliness, agility with the spreadsheet, and the capacity for analytics, and progressively some of these things, in, in places as remote as these casamounts, are able to do pivot tables at the drop of a hat. Uh, I, I would challenge the... 300 attendees to this meeting to tell me if they're able to do a pivot table, if they even know what that is. Uh, all of this is based on paper, cloud backups, very resilient. Now, for the whole thing to work, the data is not something that is collected for the project or for an outside off-taker. Uh, the data was embedded in the extension service delivery. It was embedded in trading practices. And uh, also, we, had, we lived by it. We, we used that data for m and &E and made sure through our data quality assessments that we had quality data. Now, all this data was stored on the network's Dropbox account, and they would give us permission to use it. Okay. Remember, the farmers own their data. That was really uh, what set the system apart. This is not a system where farmers are beneficiaries. They own the information, and they are the ones producing it, curating it, and trading it. Now, at a certain level, we moved to technology evolved, you know, over time. This started out in 2013-14, and as it moved on, digital 
uh, frontline technology was evolving, and we thought, okay, maybe we want to go to frontline uh, applications, and there's something to be done. Our approach to that, again, was uh, to repurpose things that already exist, okay? Uh, for, uh, I put a little note at the bottom of the picture. Uh, the, one of the platforms we selected was Comcare, uh, because the Magi had a presence in Senegal, and well, they they ticked a lot of boxes to make it an attractive uh, application. One of the elements that was really attractive is that Comcare was a, an application that was actually developed for healthcare support, and so you know we had uh, it represents a vested, in, uh, you know, an investment of twenty-two million dollars that we didn't have to reproduce, and its structure itself was very uh, adaptable to the context of farming. So we were able to change it from ComCare to ComAgri. We did that with other applications. There was a, a, a very nice uh, little price discovery app that was developed by a Senegalese firm called Mluma, but we shifted it from a price discovery system to a peer-to-peer real-time local climate data exchange. Uh, we did the same thing with a, another local firm who had developed something for a single farm rice management module, which in the end turned into a system that tracked rice uh, across the entire Senegal River Valley. Now, this idea of repurposing existing platforms is a very powerful cost savings and optimization uh, strategy. Uh, people in market system theory call that exaction. Basically, what Steve Jobs did when took the, uh, the Xerox uh, photocopier interface and turned it into the Macintosh mouse. Uh, he, he just took a good idea that was used in another sector and just put it in another domain. And you have a lot of examples of that. I think Parasto's example is another example of this kind of repurposing of a platform. But the, this repurposing brings is that you you already have these time and volume stress tested algorithms, okay? You you want to have those platforms to be open and flexible though, that so you can redefine basic labels or adjust interfaces. It has to lend itself to that. And and Comcare and the Senegalese uh, designed application did lend themselves to that. Also you want to have functionalities that allow for upload and download mechanism so that the data is not trapped within the application and can be repurposed itself and shared and, and really maintain the farmer ownership. Now, this involves uh, you know, more sophisticated work to ensure that the platform allows for access and separation rules and, and also defining new billing methods that allow for more distributed billing of the services. Also, it also benefits if you create locally trained service providers in these technologies so that you're not just overburning the platform owners and you, you develop this kind of distributed capacity throughout the company. Overall, it was actually quite successful. Uh, Comcare uh, itself, uh, you know, is a public domain, has a public domain access uh, policy. It's a social enterprise, and actually that encouraged enough and the use of the technology by other programs. So in Senegal only, Comagri became uh, Comango, which is sponsored by ISC. Uh, Combanan is coming up. And also a, a yogurt company, Dolima, actually used Comcare's uh, vaccine distribution uh, supply chain technology to distribute yogurt in, in throughout Dakar. So all this whole thing is about piggybacking on a a file structure, on a cloud environment, and, and on existing skills. And so this kind of repurposing is a very powerful way to develop like multi-purpose uh, solutions that in the end can become sustainable. Uh, overall, the end picture and the fantasy we all have is this notion of a cloud-based ag value chain ERP. For those who don't know ERP, the definition is there, it's enterprise resource planning. Uh, and here you have to see that the farmer contribution is actually 
put the data in the system, and then gradually de develop value-added interactions with the whole value chain here. But the farmer's contribution of quality data is already a given up to now in Senegal. Through those Excel spreadsheets that are in uploadable format, they're able to contribute to uh, this system from day one. They're already transferring data directly to the seed suppliers, directly to the banks, but on a one-on-one -on -one basis with their Excel spreadsheet. But developing the central environment would actually be a powerful one. We look at it with Comcare, but it's not just Comcare. It's not just the Dimagi thing. Um, to conclude this, just the, the main takeaways I just want you to understand is that a big key of sustainability is the ability for farmer networks to feed these systems uh, for free. You know, I mean, because they find value in it. They won't pay a fee, but they can generate value to a system that can be monetized with their partner. But to be adopted, I want to stress that farmers very quickly understand the notion of information ownership, and we have to be careful that those platforms, when they are developed, need to protect the data ownership of the farmers, must allow portability of data sets and autonomous storage, and provide control to those farmers on the way they share their data, because they are the owners. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Michel. Um, hopefully, hopefully my audio is coming through clear. Um, as was noted by Josh at the outset, I'm Casey Harrison. I'm the Livelihoods and Agribusiness Director at Neuro International. And today I'm going to provide you all with two perspectives on a single ag tech theme. Um, that theme being that sustainable ag tech business models need to be user focused. And we'll unpack that a little bit throughout my presentation. Um, and the two perspectives, one is coming from a collaborative network of organizations called EMEA, which I'll introduce in a moment. And then the other is the experiences of Nuru International and the local Nuru NGOs um, that we work with closely in three countries currently with a focus on Nigeria. So just to quickly begin, um, Nuru local NGOs uh, operate in three countries currently, led by uh, these three local leaders, uh, Managing Director Pauline Wambedi in Kenya, Managing Director Avi Meshiche in, in Ethiopia, and Executive Director Amy Gaman in Nigeria. And as was mentioned at the outset, uh, we all share a vision as the local NGOs and Nuru International, which is to cultivate lasting, meaningful choices in the most vulnerable and marginalized communities in the world. And we do this, and I'll go through this in a moment, um, by working through farmer organizations and farmer-led businesses. Before I do that, I want to also begin with EMEA, which is the Agribusiness Market Ecosystem Alliance. And the key theme here for this uh, element of uh, focusing on users is about creating innovation through collaboration, which is something I think Jean-Michel touched on just a minute ago. But briefly introducing EMEA, this is the list of uh, network members as well as the strategic partners. And if the link's not available now, I'll share it in the chat in a moment. You can look at the website for yourself and dig into a little bit more detail there about EMEA. Um, the way that EMEA does this and really uh, incentivizes and accelerates the professionalization of farm organizations is through this EMEA framework which is primarily predicated upon um, approving and um, quality assessment related to curricula and um, assessment protocols that are utilized to um, provide farm organizations with detailed feedback and opportunities for learning um, so that they can uh, identify and engage more, more strategically within the value chain as well as with markets, financial institutions, and others. So where does... Um, ag tech fit into this? Well, generally, um, the EMEA network and the ag tech working group that I lead is that we believe ag tech can be disruptive, but also needs to be appropriate. And so to further define this as a group, we honed in on six key criteria. Uh, the first criteria is uh, an ag tech, um, tech, agricultural technology that is endorsed by an EMEA member. And this is key because it means an EMEA member, like um, the presentations we've seen, from our two partners here today is that you know, they're willing to endorse that this technology has worked in their projects or in the field um, at a given time. 
And so they want to promote that and believe that the business model of that ag tech um, is something that is on its way towards sustainability or shows great promise. The other five criteria are based on a detailed literature review that was conducted in 2018. But if you want more information, you can download the Agricultural Technology Guide for Advancing Professional Farm Organizations, which should be available to you. Today, what I'm going to focus on and dig into a little bit deeper is demand. Um, and the reason I want to focus on the demand indicator is because any ag tech te technology business model that's going to be sustainable in helping to uh, provide development opportunities in rural Africa is really going to need to focus um, on the consumer and who is that consumer. And so in, in this case, I'm going to be talking about rural consumers of agricultural technologies and primarily farmers because at this point, for that solution to be sustainable, it really does have to speak to the needs of the farmer and, um, and that customer in the long term. So in order to do that, I'm going to focus on Nuru's work a little bit in a little bit more detail. Um, and to start with a brief introduction of how we identify and provide feedback to our ag tech partners regarding uh, local user needs, um, I already mentioned that we have local NGOs staffed by uh, local leaders as well as young professionals from the region. Um, and they're the ones who are applying and adapting human-centered design tools. Um, they're further recruiting and training local staff. And they're developing those, um, the key uh, capacities necessary to be able to engage more actively in uh, the digital technology space, um, as well as in the value chain more broadly, as well as with um, different negotiating skills that would be needed for different uh, um, engagements with off-seed off seed providers, input providers, and then also in the off-taking space when you're also looking to access markets. So we're providing a variety of capacity development opportunities for farmers in rural areas. So one of the ways that we do this um, is we apply what we call the new room model, which is a seven-step model. Um, and then we've also embedded digital technology into that model at different parts in this process. And so it includes, the, the integration of ag tech includes a wide variety of technology um, as well as the digital literacy skills, but the computer skills and the hard skills that uh, Jean-Michel had mentioned as well is a key feature of it. So for example, Nuru Kenya has developed a technical and vocational training school um, where they're providing computer skills to, uh, to young farmers, uh, women, and other entrepreneurs in, the, in southwestern Kenya where they don't have access to a training center for that type of uh, hard computer skill. And this way, they're building up the skill set to engage with Microsoft's uh, Excel, Word, as well as with the Google Suites, that they're able to just have those basic skill sets um, that there's really, as uh, Jean-Michel said, there's really a demand for it. And there's a desire to gain, because there is an awareness of this and so in those communities. And so the ability to access that training on a regular basis and that coaching becomes a huge part of the journey towards sustainability for both, uh, well, the journey of the farmer itself and the individual but also the journey of sustainability and accessing these digital solutions um, and some of these front-end and uh, front-facing applications that uh, were mentioned earlier. So really building a foundation of digital literacy and computer skills. Um, we also provide another, a, a number of other opportunities built into this around agronomic training, uh, financial inclusion training. We do savings groups and other activities. But um, if you go to the new Rural website, you can learn a little bit more about that in greater detail and also engage with us uh, outside of this presentation. But in short, ag tech is in embedded at around step three, four, and five within the cooperatives itself. And we go through a process of, pi of research, piloting, and then mainstreaming the technology based on the feedback and demand from the farmers themselves and the leaders of the farmer organizations and businesses that we serve. So that's really our, our three-part process of identifying appropriate and disruptive solutions in Neuro. So to dig in a little bit deeper to how this applies, to um, our context where Nuru Nigeria operates. Um, currently, Nuru Nigeria operates in Northeast Nigeria in Adamawa State. Um, and one of the things, and this, this slide essentially speaks for itself, but one of the most important principles of our work and the model applied in this region with the local team led by Amy is that they're supporting women first. And that's how we're engaging any beneficiary to our programming. It starts with women in the household, and then men are, are engaged at a later date. And this is to ensure that women gain access to the benefits of the programming and to the bundled services that we provide, including inputs and seeds as pictured here, demonstration plots and other activities, but also the digital technologies that we provide and that I'm going to talk about one of those partnerships are in the digital financial inclusion space in a moment. But the way that we engage with these women is we, be, we first off organize them into groups of farmer associations, and then at a later date they're organized into cooperative units. 
And this, this is a really important point to make, as I mentioned earlier, because it allows women and, and men, farmers in rural areas, to be able to spread out the cost of, of adopting digital services and technologies. It also allows them to um, gain economies of scale when engaging with markets and financial institutions as well. Another key feature here is that in this area, um, there's clearly an adoption and availability of cellular phones and feature phones. But we have to remember that even in Nigeria, many, um, many of the phone owners in the country own two devices. So your numbers are a little bit skewed in terms of overall um, accessibility to um, the hardware necessary to engage with digital services. So this is another gap that we bridge with our programming. There's also high levels of insecurity because of proximity to um, conflict in the Northeast. And so the, the necessity and the need to digitize cash, trans cash, um, cash flow and to digitize um, loan repayments, to digitize um, the payments after the marketing of the agricultural product at the end of the season, in this case soybeans and groundnuts, is imperative in order to increase the level of security for the farmers themselves. So what's the solution and who's the partner? We're working with Cellulant and using the Ting product um, Cellulant is a regional digital financial services player that operate in 13 countries. They've had operations ongoing since 2003, and they're pretty famous for a case study rolling out the AgriCorp platform with, Niger with the Nigerian government. But one of the key elements here that's important to note, this is the only actual uh, digital wallet that's available in the region, um, and so in, that, in Adamawa State itself. And so we were quite limited in our ability after doing um, extensive desktop research, engaging, engaging with local community members, as well as with key informants, led by our local team in Nigeria, um, to pilot and test this product, which we're undergoing at this time. But it offers a lot of benefits. Obviously, there's electronic payments via SMS, access via web, USSD, and IVR. They had an established agent network in other parts of the country that we could then leverage and support as we look to um, scale the agent network in uh, Adamala State. But obviously, insecurity, as listed at the bottom of the slide, is a big challenge there. So working with a partner like Nuru and other local NGOs is key for that agent network to be able to establish a foothold of um, safe cash, cash, transa cash to cashless transactions, which is a requirement for any uh, mobile money or digital wallet to work and provide a service to farmers because you can't, you have to be able to turn your money into the digital currency and then convert it back when needed. And so there has to be an agent available to do that, as we all know. Um, the last piece I'll mention here is the challenges in the, uh, the digital financial inclusion space in Nigeria. It's, it's a very different case study to the Kenyan one in which you have sort of Mpesa and Safaricom with kind of a dominant role, essentially a monopoly at this stage. Um, and Nigeria is trying to avoid that, but that has also slowed the process of developing enabling policy. And we can talk more about that um, in some of the Q&A if, 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 if it's interesting. So I'm going to begin to summarize now. Um, about the key theme here, which was being user focused and generating that grassroots demand for digital services, because this is the, the long term customer base, the farmers, the rural areas um, for digital services such as uh, digital agricultural solutions, as well as digital financial solutions. Um, urban areas, you're seeing a much faster uptake of these services because of the availability and the density of populations, but you're seeing and a dispersed population with various challenges like the lows I, I laid out. You're having some, you need to um, have a concerted effort to really recruit and support that customer base. And so delivering digital literacy and, and computer skills opportunities is key. Um, also supporting women first and the meaningful participation of women. As we know from you know, decades of financial inclusion studies, women are more likely to uh, repay their loans on time and in full. And that's something else that needs to be, that is a big part of engaging um, and paying and, have, and developing a, a consistent willingness to pay for a service over time. So women have to be a key um, focal point for any sort of um, digital solution or ag tech solution that's being rolled out in rural areas. Building agency and um, opportunity, aggregated opportunity through farm organizations again, as I mentioned earlier. And then also building out the, the leverage, the skill sets um, to leverage these digital ecosystems is also key. And these are all things that Nuru does within each of our local organizations and something that I, I know many other organizations are doing as well, but it's the foundation and something that has to be um, emphasized on a regular basis. And then lastly, enabling innovation through collaboration. Um, prioritizing new technologies through shared learnings and trust. A MAYA network provides this opportunity. 
Um, I, I invite you to go to the AgTech webinar page where we have a number of webinars with AgTech companies as well as with the MAYA members discussing, sharing openly, and um, really learning to apply these lessons that we've all had in our own work. Elevating local perspectives. We're not, I know we're elevating them today through <laughs> global perspective or global speakers, but I think elevating more local speakers through local and bringing their local perspectives and their challenges will be key uh, going forward with these types of discussions around ag tech sustainability and business models that are relevant to rural areas. And then lastly, the enabling policy environment um, and understanding more of what that looks like in different contexts, so comparing Kenya and Nigeria in more detail and having some of that available to um, those who are in these types of collaborative environments. So I probably went over time, but I'll pass it back to Josh and Zachary to um, begin the Q&A. Looking forward to it. Great. Thanks, Casey. Um, you may or may not have gone over time, but we are under time from the three of you together. So that's, um, that's the good story. So we have a little bit of an extra time for uh, Q&A. Um, and I see there's been a lot of really great, great questions. Um, so thank you for... Um, asking all of these. I know that uh, so far Prosto and um, Jean-Michel have responded to some of them in the chat, uh, but I wanted to pick out um, a couple here to start with, and I'm going to ask these to, to all of the presenters for your, um, your perspective. There were a few people who had asked questions related to uh, data ownership, um, and I think, you know, it's an interesting one, because as we know from some of the most successful sort of mass market uh, digital services like Facebook, Google, um, even Amazon to an extent, you know, the, the trade is data for service. So that's, you know, they provide services for free um, and users basically pay for that with their data. Um, and so, you know, a, a few different questions came up linked to the issue of data ownership who owns the data? Um, Abdullah asked about um, legal issues related to um, farm data ownership, um, you know, particularly as um, you know, there's in some cases in the farm organizations may or may not be fully aware of um, their rights um, as it relates to data ownership and, and laws related to data ownership. Certainly, very. Um, Based on country, um, so I'm I'm curious to all of our presenters. Do you have any thoughts on that? You know how how should and can we be thinking about data ownership in relation to um, business model viability, uh, recognizing the fact that oftentimes, as I said, the easiest pathway to viability is just to exchange data. And so that becomes a value to the company that's providing the service, but then the originator of that data, in this case farmers or farm organizations, then lose uh, control over that data. Um, so feel free, any of the presenters, to jump in first, but I'd really welcome everyone's thoughts on this. Josh, would uh, you like to start on that? Please, Michelle. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, I'll start with an anecdote uh, because, I mean, all the, the objections we can say that, yes, data is there, there is a privacy risk, that's true. But uh, at one point I, last year, I visited a series of groups just to see how that was going. That was pre-COVID. And uh, I met with a small group in Casamon, and I asked them, you know, how's it going? And they said, yeah, well, this organization came and, and asked to deal with us. And the condition was that we adopt their system, but uh, when we asked them, you know, do we get the data? Because they said, you know, you, you just enter the data in this app and, and then we'll be selling you stuff and things like that. They said, no, they said, we don't want to do that because we want to have access to the information. And the person, the organization that was providing that could not return to us the data so we could use it and they forfeited uh, they said you know we own our information and we will share it if we trade with you but if we don't want to trade with you we want to be all hard so I thought that those that shows that there are great instincts 
Now, does it mean that the legal framework is adequate to protect farmers against that? Absolutely not. But what it does mean that if we believe that farmers and collectors of information, sharers of information, it's already a great step because that's not the case. A lot of applications focus on farmers as beneficiaries or as passive users of information, not as organizations that have agency. And just recognizing that and bringing it in the open, developing a legal framework around that will go a long way in developing data sharing activity where bringing your information well, will reduce the cost and will drive the time. Uh, but, you know, creating a fully open environment where all your information Jean-Michel, sorry to interrupt, but your your audio is really um, is breaking up a bit now. I don't know if you, if it's the placement of your microphone or okay. Oh, but if you can, okay. That seems a little bit better. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So, anyway, so I just wanted to to finish on that. Is that uh, data has value, but what's important is you decide what you share and when you do it in your relation in your commercial relationship or others. And and we do have to recognize that farmers need to have agency on their data. But the good news is that you know there can be capacities locally that are able to do that within a group. And the notion of digital literacy is uh, often very restrictive. Uh, you don't necessarily need to have everyone able to manage the data, it's just that the organization has to have a few skills to be able to do it. And I think that, that exists. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to some of those points that Sean Michel was making um, as well. And I think there's a few, we've um, conducted a number of webinars with different ag tech companies that you can find in one of the links that I shared and Mark shared as well, who's the director of EMEA. Um, and if I didn't make it clear, we're a member of EMEA. I apologize, and I lead the Ag Tech Working Group. But we've had this discussion with a number of companies, including a few blockchain companies and others, um, because it's, it's an obvious uh, risk and concern that we're putting, we're not following a do no harm principle by not creating that agency that John Michel had um, laid out there, that there needs to be agency in understanding your data rights and how your data gets used as a farmer. So this is definitely a concern and a bubbling up topic. I don't think there is, and obviously it's going to depend on a country specific policy framework as well, um, but also internationally how co companies outside of a country um, utilize that data. Um, and it's a conversation that I think goes well beyond this group. But all that being said, there is a responsibility of the company that's licensing out the software and collecting the farmer data, especially if we're talking about sort of enterprise resource management softwares supply chain softwares, and so on, um, to provide, um, at the very least, again, this goes back to that basic digital literacy, and it's a comprehensive subject and topic area um, that really does need to be unpacked um, further, and I think, you know, 10 to 12 minute presentation is a hard place to do that. But um, farmers having an ability to engage with um, the licensing agreements and other, and how their data will be used in a meaningful way that means something to them and that they understand is feedback and research that we could further um, expand at this time. So I think it's a very important place to continue this dialogue and discussion. I think I'll just add a little bit to that. And that, I mean, as a result as a project is requiring data collection, uh, we do understand that there are farmers that don't want to share their information. So part of the project, we tried to minimize any major requirements. If a farmer didn't want to give any of you know, their information, they don't have to. It's just we didn't want to require, we didn't want to make it a requirement of other than their name and their phone number, any other additional information, their location, their animal, the number of cows they have, any of those additional it was, it's up to them whether or not they share it. And we didn't want to increase the level of requirements because some have rejected and it's been fine. It doesn't restrict them from participating and getting access to inputs. But 
yeah, it, 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 the data that we collect is not used beyond the verification process, but it does allow for the input suppliers to use it um, and access their farmers to increase their relation, improve their relationships. But yeah, not not much has gone into it from our side. Great, thanks everyone. Um, so another question that was a common theme that came up uh, a few times that I see here is in relation to um, the ongoing costs post uh, project intervention. So um, you know, a couple of people out of the fact of uh, you know, who, for in the case of ag results and um, the platform that you're using, uh, Parasto, and then with Comcare in, in your case, Joe Michelle, um, they'd asked who's paying for that after the fact. Um, you know, who's paying for the, the ongoing, any ongoing licensing fees or subscription fees? Um, and also, you know, somebody asked about you know, who owns the, the platform. I mean, presumably, in each of the instances that everyone has cited, you're using third-party providers, so they own their platforms. Um, but if you could you know, talk a little bit to those, the ongoing costs that may be involved in how um, those are covered after the fact once the project stepped away. Sure, I can go ahead and get started. Um, as part of the Ag Results Design, we're using, we, we did a, you know, an open competition to ID a platform that met our needs. Oh, we're using the Crop-In platform, uh, took an off-the-shelf system that they had developed uh, so that we weren't creating something brand new, recreating the wheel. And as part of our requirements, it was it's a platform that can be then individually licensed from our competitors. How much it will cost, I think, will depend on, you know, the number of competitors that are buying into it. But it it, it is a requirement that it is a reasonable and just a licensing fee, a lot of our upfront costs for developing it to, mod to make minor tweaks to it, but it is an option for the competitors. We're still very early on in our project where um, there have been questions about, you know, how much it will cost down the road. It's still, I mean, we haven't completed our first sales period to really know, but the level of participation, what we've seen on our results is we start with only a few competitors and it increases, you know, multiple fold over time. And so Cropin has said they'd work with them. Licensing fees would be the only payment that would be required. Maintenance and uptake um, isn't really going to be a problem because it is an off-the-shelf platform that they regularly update across the board. But this is something that Cropin has wanted to kind of look at is how can they start working with individual private sector entities that can be relationships established for the long term instead of just focusing on, you know, donor funded projects that end after a few years and then the use of their platform kind of ends with the project. Uh, so that's where they're trying to focus and trying to move towards and that's what we're working with them on as well. Yeah, from, from our perspective, and I, I tried to highlight this a bit in my presentation, you know, the way that we work with our local communities through the local NGOs, um, the new rural NGOs, and those teams uh, work directly with pharma organizations and cooperatives. It's to really go through a process of um, piloting, testing, and feedback, and then mainstreaming if there is a willingness to adopt at the pharma organization and cooperative level, depending on the complexity. In some cases, like with the digital wallet, you're talking about individual users. Um, but even that requires the, that same type of uh, feedback mechanism to have a better understanding of the usefulness and some of the challenges they have in engaging with the product. Um, sometimes it might be accessibility of agent networks or other things, but there's usually a variety of those challenges. So the cost structure really depends on the technology first, but in this case, um, looking at those institutions and communities that can um, spread and distribute the cost for the licenses or the sub-license fees that are required depending on what the software is. So if we're talking about uh, like an enterprise resource management software, distributing that across a network.
of cooperatives with the union taking the lead is one way to think about how to distribute those costs more evenly and so that it's not being taken on by one institution. And in many cases, you know, if we're not talking about high value crop value, ch value chains like uh, cocoa or coffee or others like that, then we're talking about farmers, um, you know, really look to with take their revolving funds from their shareholders as well and then also the, the um, net profits that they're gaining at the end of each season and reinvesting that in those digital technologies over time. And so again, this comes back to understanding the kind of constraints and then those needs in those local communities and that context. Um, and even though I only touched briefly on that context and where our work is, I mean, the, that's why having that local presence and someone who can help assist in communicating that to the tech side and translating some of that nationally and subnationally in each country is so vital. So having those local partners um, to act as a go-between in the short term and have their own sort of um, concept of um, exiting their services over time. So leaving behind the, the demand, the negotiation, and the willingness to pay at the farmer organization level, um, I think is the, is the way forward when it comes to uh, digital development in rural areas. Uh, to, uh, uh, one thing that's interesting with uh, you know certain certain platforms uh, is that they are designed to be modified, okay? and so uh, that's also you know putting the you know the challenge to the uh, platform developers rather than developing closed architectures, developing open architectures. I think that's what really brought us to work with Home Care is that they have a whole series of public domain applications. Once you develop an application, you can put it out there and it's available to other people to use. Uh, and also they encourage uh, local service providers to develop applications using the software and the various functionalities. And there's a whole little ecosystem in parallel of, of the actual health application that has been developed by users. So that kind of openness, I think there is a challenge for platform developers to really rethink their technological model and allow for flexibility, adaptability, because the model I showed at in my, one of the last slides I showed is a dangerous model. The idea of saying, okay, we're going to develop a big farmer ERP, that is dangerous because you're going to put all your money on one big model that's centralized and is going to uh, trading and market systems are, are much more fluid. So I think that the models that work are models that uh, are based on very robust data collection systems, a bit like the and all that, but then developing interoperability plugins and things like that. And, uh, you know, you do want to have what I would call a bit of creative chaos. However, a strong legal framework in terms of data sharing and elements like that. Uh, the value comes from the data, but also the value of the data is huge for uh, banks, uh, insurance companies, the logistics of input distribution. And so all these elements and the willingness to pay for the farmers is not high. And the farmers actually, with the Excel spreadsheet, got an even you know, another excuse not to pay because he's saying, I'm getting everything I need with those spreadsheets. All I have to do is pay for my agent, and that's what we do. But if you ask them to pay for a fee for a platform, they say, what do I get out of that? Because I can already do what I need. But uh, it's clear that for insurance companies, and those applications really caught their eye. However, it's true that there is some comp good investments we made in projects to work with those platforms and, and uh, have them adapt their systems so that they can really uh, develop the versatility that's needed if ever those ERP systems are to uh, the life of them. So that's my, that's my point. You know, I, I, if you look at the AgResult program, crop in was the platform that was selected as part of a, a competition for milk dealers. However, I would say that crop-in is actually 
an innovation in itself that would merit a support to really develop and adapt its model to be more flexible to other sectors. So maybe AgResult can extend its competition to platform owners to develop competing models so that they can come up and enhance their value and their interconnectivity within the value chain. Great, thanks for that. Uh, so another um, question that, or a threat, is a theme that I'm seeing uh, from the questions that I wanted to pose to everyone is really in terms of inclusivity. So I saw, you know, one participant asked about uh, in terms of, you know, whether um, you know, platforms are available just in, you know, sort of a, a single language, maybe it's just French or English, or are they also available in local languages? Also one about gender, um, gender divide, um, which we know is in terms of digital access, um, does exist in many of the, the countries where we all work. Um, and so, and I think the, the questions on on that topic are really linked to how do you uh, help to avoid widening uh, barriers further, you're widening um, disparity in terms of access to information, whether it is because somebody does not have access to a device um, or it's because uh, it's not available in the language that they uh, fluently speak or, or understand or are literate in. Um, so I'd be curious to any of the speakers if you have any thoughts uh, on that. Thank you, um, I think I'll have to get started. Given that our first year there was initial pushback because in case for results, everything has to be funded by the private sector entity before any money or prizes are given out at the end of a sales series. And there was initial pushback regarding smartphones uh, or tablets to collect the information. And when we first launched the project, we thought it might be something that we would potentially have to provide. But over time, we started seeing investments being made by competitors that they were able to leverage the project and access finance and then invest that in their business model and purchasing the tools that they need. The language barrier hasn't really been a challenge uh, with our competitors and their extension agents. Uh, we have heard that SMS going on English was, would have been a challenge. So from the onset, we had our SMS messages to the farmers translated. Um, so those have really been, that's really been the feedback that we've heard. To date, we have seen all of our competitors invest and purchase the tools that they need to be able to participate in the competition. So it, it has been something that we've heard about, but not anything that the project has really had to make any changes or adapt to. Yes. Uh, I think concerning inclusion, what uh, you have to understand that, you know, What's important is not just, uh, you know, transferring data just like that. I mean, it's the whole notion of decision making and how that is accessible to all and the move towards like data driven methodology. And also, does inclusivity mean that everyone needs to have retail access to data or will you have, or, you know, organizations being part of an organization that is built around data-driven processes. And so uh, that's where, you know, the notion of the farmer organization takes all its meaning. That's really a conduit for uh, And I do believe that what goes a long way is the ability to distribute the processing point, distribute the data collection point, so that, uh, you know, organizations are closer to what the, uh, the all this analytical work is, where it is at, and that youth are part of that. And uh, again, you know, having youth within the community developing those skills uh, really opens a, a very different scene 
and actually it's something that is open to uh, young men, but also a lot of young women, because the literacy levels and education levels uh, have a much more balanced uh, gender profile. And uh, young women who develop these data skills and locally uh, very quickly become very strong and are able to channel benefits of data-driven decision-making uh, right up to their own. So, you know, this kind of physical proximity uh, of digital uh, know-how and system is, is important. Uh, you know, an app that is managed from a remote place will not uh, be ideal uh, to really reach the, the farm gate, reach the person in the there has to be some in the delivery. Yeah, inclusion is an important topic. Um, I think the most the most important takeaway when you're when we're speaking about inclusion is it's not a passive act, it's not a passive um, activity. It's not something that we can assume will come with availability. Uh, I think too often in the past we've done that with a, with programs itself and um, so really inclusion is an action um, it requires uh, principled action it requires intentionality in programming um, it requires intentionality in how you uh, develop your business model and your specific customers as I was talking about earlier um, if you want to have women included in digital and ag tech solutions or fintech solutions and you need to figure out how to target through as Jean-Michel put it, I think was, you know, that, that decision making and where that power lies in the community, in the household, in the farmer organization. You have to analyze that and understand that, um, and then in target opportunities that limit harm towards those individuals, those households, those communities, those farmer organizations, to ensure that the people you're hoping that are generally marginalized are actively include, included. Um, in those activities, whether it's youth, women, or um, other you know groups, demographic groups that are, are generally marginalized in different contexts, and this goes back again then to going to a higher level, understanding the context in which you're applying uh, the digital technology um, that, you're, that you're looking to to bring to those communities as part of your programming. Great, thanks, Katie. So picking up on that, you know, Katie, you mentioned uh, intentionality. Um, I think there was one question uh, that somebody asked in terms of, you know, given the fact that in uh, I think each of the, the examples that uh, everyone shared, there was a, a degree of repurposing or working um, from existing platforms or services. Um, and, you know, they said that sometimes there's a barrier of not being able to then design with the user, um, you know, not really fully deploy or, or employ human-centered design approaches. Uh, so I'm curious, I mean, from what I heard from Arasto and Jean-Michel, um, you know, you, uh, you did work to customize um, those platforms, um, and certainly ComCare is a, a customizable um, platform to a, to a degree. Um, but I'm curious if any of you have any perspectives on that. So how, how do you really make sure that you are um, designing with the user when you're also relying in part on existing uh, services or platforms that may have been you know, not really designed uh, with your users um, fully in mind? Yeah, I'll start real quick um, just to clarify a few points I made earlier. Um, this is again within the new model by the local NGO and the, the local staff and the local leaders at uh, the new rule uh, organizations I referenced are so vital um, to deliver that feedback in many cases in the early stages of our project cycles, um, which vary from five to seven years um, towards that point of exit and sustainability and scaling to new regions. Um, it's, the, it's, it's, it's that staff and that, those professionals that, that play a role in bridging a gap of information from the, the, the digital platform or the service provider. So in this case, in Nigeria, it's Ting or Cellulant, 
um, and the Ting team and conveying those challenges that they're experiencing, but also receiving that information um, and that feedback from the Ting agents and the, the Ting team and segment team, bringing that information as to how do we best pilot and test um, in a secure setting the delivery of an agent network to farmers to convert cash into cashless payments and, and vice versa. Um, so really transferring, and, and so that, that feedback loop often is, it, is it something that can't be assumed, especially in some very vulnerable regions of the developing world, can't be assumed that that's going to be naturally there or sustained by an informal or, uh, again, a, 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 a not strong institution of some kind, a farm organization that's not capacitated to, to manage its long-term viability from a business perspective or from um, a member perspective. And so there is a period of, of time in which there needs to be some kind of scaffolding in place, and that's sort of how we um, talk about this on multiple levels within Nuru, is you need to have that scaffolding to allow that foundation to settle, to form those relationships to be built, those feedback loops to be built, and then also that customer base at the farm organization level to decide when no longer is that, ta that provider, that platform or that service provider, the one they want to continue with because a new opportunity has arrived in their community. And the mobile money sector in Nigeria is rapidly evolving. Soon the MNOs will be more involved. You'll have Airtel and, and um, MTN probably mainstreaming something um, that's a little bit easier to use with a feature phone um, and makes transactions and agent networks more easy to access. One thing I didn't mention, if there's no banks too, it makes it hard to get cash out, so the agent network is very important in an insecure region. So again, I'm just highlighting some details, but that information and that sharing of information really is predicated upon first having a local NGO or a local third part or a local agent or a local footprint of people and professionals willing to negotiate, discuss, and share information, and then having that transition to local institutions led by farmers, by the rural community itself, rather than an NGO like a Nuru local organization or another entity. So it's really about phasing that approach, having the, the scaffolding in place to allow the foundation to settle. And then, at that point, allowing the ecosystem and the information to flow between parties. Yeah, I'd like to um, continue on that. Oh. As far as, as local presence, you hear me? Is it okay? Yes, yeah, a bit better, Jean Michel. Okay, so uh, quickly, one thing that allows for ongoing adjustment, one, the level of versatility of the application itself and the, the ability to, to bring uh, adjustments and modifications uh, without, I mean, going to the central uh, programming level. And uh, in the case of, uh, of ComCare, what was interesting is that there is that openness. And one thing we invested in to make the modification was the uh, integration of local IT providers who have those skills and became, let's say, a preferred service provider. Like you have like Microsoft you know, preferred service providers, you have Google uh, services providers. And well, you know, uh, Comcare was open to, to develop that kind of relationship. That, that proved powerful because adaptations to the interface, the framework, the download protocol, we're actually, you know, bringing those adjustments during the scaffolding phase that uh, that Casey mentioned was actually very cost-effective and very responsive. And actually, we were capitalizing within the country the ability for that flexibility and adaptability of the design. And that's exemplified by the fact that quickly the initial app that was designed through project support was picked up it was initially targeting cereals trading like maize, rice, millet. Well, was transferred to uh, the mango sector, was transferred to the banana sector, and was even picked up for the yogurt sector by a, a private company and others. And, and that actually was allowed to those local service firms. Also, I just want to, to close on the fact that you know, when we talk about designing, and uh, even Comcare calls it designing under the mango tree, uh, it's 
we should also remember that design is not just about the retail interface. What I call the retail interface is what's on the smartphone or, or with the direct user. There's the, when we're talking about transaction facilitation, there's the whole back office link, uh, link back to the uh, input suppliers, link back to the banks, link back to uh, the insurance companies or with the uh, marketing partners. And those are actually, you know, sophisticated uh, engineering linkages uh, that would benefit by some kind of, of cost share support to really develop the basic infrastructures and skills within the country to understand what this uh, digitally facilitated trading really means. And I think that's an area that is lacking. We're, we're talking about farmer capacity, but, you know, what Parasta was talking about, having the organizations themselves have their own digital outreach strategy and, and develop these different tools or connectivity having banks really understand what it means to deploy this kind of uh, trading system uh, would go a long way. I, I think there is a lot of things coming in the future as uh, these uh, markets really understand what ERP really means. And, and, uh, and I'll just finish on that on my old age. I, I was lucky in my CV, that's what it says, that I started my career when the, there was this transition to the ERP system, to the electronic data interface. That's the late 80s and 90s. That was a pretty traumatic moment for the North American economy, but it really paid off. But here we're in that, you know, pre-ERP phase, and, uh, you know, it really means a reengineering of the system, but it is not something that can be handled by a single platform. There has to be a bit of controlled chaos, but everyone has to have the same digital skill set, and that involves the entire market. Okay, I think I can just come in with a quick um, answer to the question. So with the ICT platform that we're using, I had mentioned in my presentation and in some of the questions answers that we did make modifications to an off-the-shelf platform. Most of the modifications that were made were actually to the interface that AgResults is using for verification. So when a competitor is recording information about sales, quantity, uh, payments received or credit sales, that interface has not changed much and it will, and it doesn't, and it won't. Uh, whereas on the back end for ag results and the sales verification, that's the side that we had to modify where we are able to see, you know, transactions that have taken place and it, are able to evaluate uh, eligibility of sales, and so there's been less modifications to the platform for the user side than there has been for our use for the competition. Great, thanks. So we have uh, time for about one last question. You'll just see that the whole layout just changed, so um, before you still listen to this last question, but also take a look at the polls here. Um, and also, please, you know, please fill them out. And you can also, um, as I previously mentioned, use resources from the files and links pods. Um, so feel free to access uh, presentations or any of the links there. Um, so the last question, and we're going to have to keep it pretty brief, everyone, um, but a couple of people raised the issue of uh, policy and enabling environment. Um, and so I'm wondering if either, if any of our presenters have any perspectives uh, both in terms of good examples of policy or regulatory, um, you know, uh, issue, uh, issues that have uh, helped to really promote and support um, more viable digital ag business models, uh, also potentially on the looking at the data um, side of things, um, and and or if you have examples of policy challenges 
that you faced um, in your work. So if anyone would like to very quickly uh, touch on that, please jump in. Okay, just to quickly, um, one uh, positive, well, a key element is going to be, especially if we're dealing with rural uh, communities, is really improving, of course, the coverage of, of internet uh, connectivity in those zones. That's, that's a given. And that should be uh, really focused on uh, specific uh, consolidation nodes where farmers group themselves and, and really target the high production areas. And that's not always a priority. Uh, the kind of error to avoid is when we talk about those platforms, uh, you know, if a, a government-led organization saw that platform, they would say, okay, the state will create a national ERP system for farmers and uh, invest a lot of money and drain a lot of money to put that together and probably crowd out, you know, private managed uh, systems. That would be very big. Uh, those platforms, I mean, you should look at developing regulatory frameworks or or basic rules of engagement on privacy and, and uh, those elements involving involve the farmer movement and the definition of those criteria. But having a state trading platform, in my sense, is dangerous simply because the, the state-led platform with people will try to protect it and people with not let it die if it's performing. And just that they create a great issue for those farmers and people market. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Parasto, uh, Casey, do you have any closing thoughts related to policy and regulatory? Um, honestly, for the agriculture project, I don't have any thoughts for the regulatory um, and enabling environment. For us, we try to focus on sectors that have limited impact from writings or policy changes because it really impacts the participation uh, and success of the competition. So overall, for the agriculture projects, no, I don't have much to add. Yeah, I mean, this is a tough one with such a short response time. I mean, it's, as I sort of concluded in my presentation, it's, you know, it's what's good or bad in terms of enabling a policy environment. I mean, we need that. There needs to be some level of competition. Um, and it's also going to depend on which tech, like what the technology is intended to do, what the platform is intended to do, right? When, within FinTech, there's obviously a debate and attention that exists with transaction fees. Um, and the money made and the revenues generated from those transaction fees. There's obviously some pushback um, when we're talking about M-Pesa and the monopoly and kind of the monopoly that Safaricom has on mobile money in Kenya. Nigeria is trying to um, really offset or, or ha have to take a different a di different route, but some of that tension also exists because they want to have control over those transaction fees and limit monopolization of some of the MNOs. So there's a tension that exists in that sector that's quite complex. Um, and then if we're talking about sort of like Jean-Michel was getting out with some of the broad scale agricultural supply chain platforms, you know, AgriCore at Cellulink Created is one of the, the more famous um, examples of a nationwide blockchain based smart contracting service and marketplace uh, for all agricultural value chain actors that has had some really good impacts on reaching farmers in rural areas. And so it's all going to come back to what are the outcomes you're trying to achieve and then who wants to, where is the tension, where is the te point of tension in relation to um, who gets access, who, who gets that revenue, or what piece of that rev of that pie is, uh, how that's distributed from government, private sector, and then how that cost is distributed down. But I, yeah, that's, but they're very interesting case studies, and I think more work around those case studies about what's optimal is certainly something that would be money well spent. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, um, for, for all the participants, and thank you to our, our three presenters. Um, we tried our best to get through as many of the questions uh, as we could. 
Uh, I know that we left some on the table, so apologies for that. Uh, but please do feel free to follow up offline with uh, any of the, the presenters. Um, also, for any of you who are interested, uh, just so you're aware, we just closed out, so AgriLinks just closed out ICT for Ag Month. This was the final webinar that happened in January with the month. This month, is the theme is data systems. Um, so for those of you who are interested in the data question, uh, I'd encourage you to look at what uh, will be going on through AgriLinks over the month of February linked to data systems. Um, and I believe that March is uh, focused on gender, so that's another one to, to flag. Um, so again, thank you everyone for your, particip for your participation today. Uh, we really appreciate it.